Uh, hello there. Good evening. I'm gonna make this a quick video. Uh, I got an early day tomorrow. Um, anyway, uh, I got an opinion. Um, it may or may not be true, but it is most certainly not being spoken about on the um, local media by it, the uh, television or internet. The greatest uh, opponent towards Russia and its possible territorial expansion um, is not the United States. It's not Ukraine. Um, the United States, believe it or not, is uh, more or less taking um, the back seat. It is a backseat driver, or tries to be, but, uh, you know, nonetheless... Um, there's another player, and has been for quite some time if you've been paying attention. Usually, in most interviews that uh, are available on uh, Western media aren't actually very good, so a lot of people don't read between the lines and see what it is. Think about it. Buffer states have always played an important part to any foreign policy. Um, Ukraine is right next door to Russia. It has no buffer state between them. There are a lot of other countries that are close enough that they could be considered buffer states, even if they're not quite next door to Russia. You know, they're the door uh, after the door. Um, however, there's one country that is far enough away uh, its northern border and southern border are uh, exempt from a uh, Russian um, increased tension uh, because of geography. And from the east is less plausible because the Russians... Um, would have to deploy their submarines, their navy, uh, and go all the way around the world, basically. And, you know, um, that's kind of risky business um, if they want to intimidate uh, this nation that I'm speaking of. The French. Um, why on earth would the French care what happens in the Ukraine. Um, I mean, let's not forget about their history in uh, World War One and World War II, um, where they were the Triple Alliance. Um, that's old news. It's got nothing to do with today. Similar how the Triple Alliance had nothing to do with the Napoleonic era. Um the French do not want any powers flexing their muscles uh, in uh, any part of the world, but especially uh, close enough to their borders without them putting in their two cents. And when I said their northern and southern flanks were basically, there's no access for the Russian Navy or any personnel, as you look at their northern one, They've got to go through all of that uh, Baltic Sea territory, so they're going to need icebreakers. It's still winter. It's winter over there, too. It's cold anyway over there. Uh, they have good icebreakers, no mistake, and maybe the uh, submarines can go under all that ice anyway. Probably not, but they'd probably need icebreakers. Um, but it would be seen, and that would be, you know... A straight up uh, they're coming after the West so that would uh, turn up the uh, war thermometer up uh, a notch um, which in this day and age is very important you can calibrate these things and also once it got to the other side it would have to get past Norwegian and United Kingdom um, as well as Icelandic um, uh, coastal defenses uh, to get within, um, I suppose, uh, striking distance of northern France. 
which would give a early warning for the French to uh, to pull back uh, if it were at that level, that, that temperature of war. Southern border is no better for the Russians um, because in order to do it, there's this narrow strait that leads right through Turkey. I mean, you may have forgotten, but... Um, Turkey and Russia don't like each other and haven't liked each other for a very long time. In more recent history, there was the downing of that uh, Russian aircraft and uh, the assassination of a uh, Russian dignitary. Um, so the Turkish uh, Navy, as well as... It's, it's a very narrow pass. Um, it's not really in the cards either. And then they would have to get past Greece. And Greece is an ally of the West, which means uh, certain technological um, Navy um, capabilities um, are going to be available to them, given to them even by the West. Um, theoretically, Israel could um, also intervene uh, because... They're um, in that sort of sphere of influence. Um, so what does this mean? Okay, so the Russians would have a uh, difficult time getting to them unless they started firing uh, long-range missiles. This is true. But, as I said before, the warning time. France would have the warning time of seeing these long-range missiles long before they got there so they could fire back essentially and a lot of people don't know this but the French are actually a quite formidable military power even today um, and uh, you know that's saying that the Russians could be stopped if they you know if Putin decides he wants to escalate things if he says, you know what, I don't care what the West thinks, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, actually, you do have to care what the West thinks because you can't do whatever you want because then that's mutually assured destruction and there's no calibration, there's no deals you can make with the United States to stop the French from pursuing its own interests. Let's remember, the French are not uh, in NATO. Um, they're in the European Union, but they're not in NATO. And uh, they haven't been for decades. And they may have been the people, that one, one of the peoples that started it, but uh, they left quite soon after its creation. Uh, they don't need to be there, and it's you know, actually better. However, the problem with this strategy is that it means everybody in between collateral damage. Uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Germany, um, Ukraine, Croatia... Bulgaria, uh, Romania, you name it. All collateral damage if they want to start firing long-range missiles at each other. But the Russians have to take that into consideration. What if the Russians annexed all of Ukraine? Uh, they've already annexed Crimea, so that would be suggesting that their mentality is if we can get away with it, we'll continue doing that. And uh, I guess theoretically they'd be gobbling up territories that uh, the USSR had to relinquish when it uh, collapsed, um, which to me doesn't really make any sense. Uh, some person even on one of my videos mentioned the word redemption. Uh, yeah, that's not the right word for it. I mean, a lot of people could say the exact same thing about the Russians. It's about a bruised ego, if, if anything. And, you know, it's nothing personal to Putin. Putin wasn't in charge, and he's done a fairly good job at being um, the leader of Russia. So um, his main opponent, who's also done very well for his country, is Macron. Macron is the big player in this. And uh, so long as uh, he can talk tough on the phone, and so can Putin, uh, I think an invasion is not likely, and uh, a peace settlement is likely. Um, the Ukrainians may have to give up some territory, we'll have to see, but, um, you know, 
they're not allowed to um, know that. So, you know, who knows what the Ukrainians think? I don't actually know any Ukrainians. Um, and, uh, you know, information on the internet, you know, a lot of them say that they're, they're gearing up for war and things like that. And, you know, sometimes that sounds kind of fun, uh, especially if you're, you know, fi practicing firing javelins. Uh, the anti-tank uh, rocket launcher. Um, yeah, I mean, who knows? But uh, it does make a huge statement uh, that the Russians cannot just do whatever they want, that there actually is a process that stops them from going, well, I want the thermostat to be at uh, 30 degrees Celsius. And then someone goes, well, I want it at 25. And then it's this long story of them talking with each other in an unpleasant tone. And this has probably been going on well over a decade about this specific issue. It's only being brought to light now because the Russians are getting fed up. And, you know, Putin has to make sure that he looks as though he can still control his, uh, his army. So he's like, yeah, I'm sending over 100,000 troops or whatever to the Ukrainian border, and he's having his planes, you know, do flybys and things like that. Uh, that's him solidifying his image of power, that he's able to control his army, because that's a lot of things that uh, cause uh, leaders of countries to lose their power, is that they cannot control their army anymore. Um, and when that happens... Um, Sometimes, obviously, or discreetly, um, they are um, uh, removed from their position one way or the other. Um, so, um, this I find to be quite an interesting subject, and people really ought to pay attention to it instead of the Super Bowl. I mean, I really don't care about the Super Bowl. Uh, I guess I'd watch it, but I didn't, but I could have, uh, but I didn't care, so I didn't. Um, yeah, so, um, real enemy, who is it? Is it the Ukrainians, the Americans, or is it Macron? Well, I'll let you decide. Have a good night.